It's no secret that queer people are inspired by Disney. Even before openly queer characters began appearing in Disney things, there were many queer-coded characters. Though a lot of early queer coding was done at the expense of LGBTQ people with them either being punchlines or threats, in the 80s and 90s, openly gay people like Howard Ashman and Kenny Ortega showed that queer coding didn't have to be an inherently bad thing. Even though it wasn't a replacement for explicit representation, it was still a step forward for giving queer people agency in telling their own stories. And some of us who grew up with these films got the idea. Even before I knew what the word non-binary was, I empathized with the Beast when he was demonized by society, and in retrospect, seeing villains like the Sanderson sisters introduced me to drag aesthetics years before I went to my first drag show. But queer coding isn't the only way that queer people have seen themselves in mainstream media. In a world where explicit queer representation is far from the standard, allegory has always been an important part of queer experience. This is why certain art forms like musicals have such queer histories. They provided spaces for people to express emotions that were not permissible in everyday life. And as a result of this, certain storylines or archetypes have specifically queer connotations. And that's where Disney's Mulan comes in, specifically the song Reflection. For a generation of trans people who grew up with the original 1998 movie, it was one of the first moments where not fitting the role society assigned you was something to empathize with, instead of just feeling ashamed. Of course, neither the movie nor that song are about Mulan being trans, but I couldn't help but see something else. Who is that girl I see staring straight back at me? Why is my reflection someone I don't know? Disney's Mulan was released on June 19th, 1998, and like many Disney retellings of stories, it's not an entirely accurate depiction of the original tale. So when talking about Mulan, just know that I'm not talking about the actual story, but just Disney's interpretation of it, problems and all. In the movie, Mulan is labeled a disgrace to her family for not being able to fit the stereotypical gender role that she was assigned. This doesn't mean that the character is trans, but you can probably see how that lends itself well to trans experience. And on top of that, she has the emotional song Reflection that specifically addresses her longing. Look at me, I will never pass for a perfect bride or a perfect daughter. Can it be? I'm not meant to play this part. The narrative of wanting to be accepted for your true self is something that goes beyond trans experience and just goes into queerness. And given that David Zappel, the lyricist for the song, is gay, it's interesting to view it as having potentially queer themes, even if they weren't explicit. What makes the song so unique is that it does much more than just tell the story. The whole movie features Mulan assuming the role of a man to take her father's place in the army, and if that was truly the only story they wanted to tell, they could have easily written a song directly addressing that. Instead, reflection is an unexpected moment of intimacy that feels like something more. Even though it results in Mulan going off to fight and then de-dragging when she gets home, this song shows that breaking gender roles was about more than just saving her father. It was also about saving herself. There's immense power in realizing something like that. And even though the character Mulan uses that to show that who she is is more than what society expects of her, it makes sense that queer people, and specifically trans people, would latch onto that sentiment. Who is that girl I see staring straight back at me? Why is my reflection Someone I don't know. Having to calibrate who you are on the inside with how you look on the outside is often an integral part of trans experience, whether that be changing your appearance or how you look at your appearance. And that's why a song like Reflection has become one of the most queer Disney songs ever. To learn more about the movie, I was able to speak with Erica Dapkowitz, an editor, artist, and composer who's worked at Disney and in particular worked on the original Mulan. 
I finished college in the early 90s and mm -hmm. got a BA in film and TV mm -hmm. production. And I quickly ended up getting a job as a production assistant at Disney. I literally got hired like right after Lion King came out. I got a crash course in kind of the, how do you make an animated film on Pocahontas? So they kind of used me as a utility PA on Pocahontas and, and and threw me around all the different departments like every two weeks. So I was in the cleanup department, mm -hmm. the animation department, the story department, the editorial department. They literally were moving me around every two weeks. It was such a great just crash course lesson for me on just like how these things are made. And then from there, I went on to Mulan in editorial. And I kind of started as a production assistant and eventually became what they kind of sometimes call it as an apprentice editor. I would do a lot of the menial things at times. I would make copies, I would order food, I would go to the animators, I'd pull scenes from them if we <laughs> cut them out. And then I just started, uh, because I was out in Florida at the time and it was a right to work state, I didn't have to be in the union, I started jumping on Avids. I already knew film because I went to film school and so I just started helping from like an assistant standpoint by like pulling in sketches, making outputs, sometimes even doing like rough builds of sequences for the main editors. Um, and really it's just like I touched almost every fabric that would come in and out of editorial, including the music. So I worked closely with Matthew Wilder who end up writing the songs. I also got to work with the late Jerry Goldsmith who wrote the, the actual score mm -hmm. for the film. One story about reflection is that we actually, the sequence in the movie was actually twice as long. There was a whole nother section where Mulan actually takes her horse and rides out into the countryside like at night and you see fireflies everywhere and stuff like that. And she's singing like another verse and another chorus to reflection that we ended up cutting for time. You've talked about working on this movie and having struggled with gender dysphoria, but having that have been a happy accident more than, I, I just wondered, it did was that a total ever flute. cross your mind while you were working on that? Like no, what the movie... I, yeah. no, I, you know, it's so interesting how fate and works in life sometimes mm -hmm. where, you sometimes you don't really plan certain things and then all of a sudden you look back on it and you're just like, oh my God, how did that <laughs> happen? Like I had been struggling with gender dysphoria ever since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it just happened to be coincidence that I ended up on this movie that so many people now look back on and relate to in so many different ways, especially the LGBTQ community. It's sometimes difficult to know the impact of something you work on at the time. When I came out in uh, 2014, I started going to the LGBTQ center here in Los Angeles. And I would meet like every Friday night with the trans group. And there was one conversation that someone started up and it had a domino effect where all the people started to talk about Mulan. And I started to get the shivers because I was just like, uh, like, I was like, what do I say? And uh, I started to kind of tear up a little bit. And they looked, everyone looked over at me and they're like, are you okay, Erica? And I just said, you know, I don't know that most of you know this, but I actually worked on that film. So like listening to like how it impacted just the people in the room, it was a bit overwhelming, but uh, in a good way. And even outside of her work with Disney, Erica's art has had an impact on the internet and a particular relevance to queerness. It's interesting because I think a lot of what I've done on the side um, as my handle, like I usually call myself Miss Mako, was done primarily for me. It was like part coping mechanism, part like psych evaluation of myself of trying to figure out my own situation and um when i was a little kid i borrowed so many notepads from my mom and dad and i would just keep writing stories about especially like you know little boys like turning into girls and stuff like that and and i got really into movie making like animated films like disney and the stuff like star wars where it's like you got transported to other worlds so all of my stories had a bit of a fantasy element to it Back when I was a kid and even in my teens, I didn't feel like I really had anything positive to look towards. Everything in the media was fairly negative. It was just like these crazy trans people, you know, there was no real grounding and anything that I could latch onto. So I decided to just keep making my own stuff. So yeah, I started making comics and because I was in animation, I learned how to make like animated stuff. So I started making my own little animated shorts and then live action shorts and then full blown movies. I'm also a musician and a composer. And a lot of the music that I've written has very, very gender trans allegories in most of the songs. When I went through years and years of psychiatry and therapy, mm -hmm. it all came out that basically it was a wish fulfillment thing where it's like, I didn't want to make the decision to do what I knew I eventually would have to do. I wanted someone else to force it upon me. So all my characters were primarily forced to become this female character. It totally came out. It was so obvious like later 
What's interesting is I don't even really make the material anymore because I've transitioned and I don't feel like I need it anymore. Like I feel like, no, I've done what I needed to do. I feel fulfilled. Like I feel really good. Allegory and metaphor are both tools that queer people can and have used to express feelings in authentic ways without having to be direct and potentially vulnerable in a society that suffers from queer phobia. It's not a substitute for explicit representation, but it's an important part of queer experience and history. And there are other examples of that within Disney. Collaborators of Howard Ashman have speculated about there being parallels between his experience as a gay man during the AIDS crisis and the role of being an outsider in Beauty and the Beast. With Mulan itself, like some of the story I shared with you about the trans group I was in, like it just shows like how much these things do often impact people who feel like they're in the minority and are just looking for something to grab onto, trying to help navigate and steer things. And I know it's not gonna happen like that. It never does. Yeah. But at least if the conversations can be had, the awareness is there, and hopefully, you know, with every generation that comes after us, it just gets be a little better and better. And that's, that's ultimately my hope. So Mulan is a movie that can be read in an empowering queer way. And the song reflection not only lays the groundwork for that context, but it's the focal point of it. Mulan spends the whole movie trying to show her family who she really is, and similarly, many trans people have spent time wanting to be like Mulan, wanting to have the courage to overcome a world that tries to suppress us. This allegory of beating the odds is not unique to Mulan. Like I've talked about before on this channel, the entire genre of I Want songs that's been so common in Disney films since the late 80s actually has a strong queer connotation and history. And allegory being a gateway for queer experience happens in many other Disney movies of the time as well. Not only does 1989's The Little Mermaid have a lot of queer coding and allegory through the character Ursula and the song Part of Your World, but the entire aesthetic of the movie can also be read as a queer allegory. Specifically, the idea of mermaids has a lot to do with trans experience. In his thesis, Mermaids and Drag Queens, A Queer Look at Mermaiding, Yuval Aframi looks at The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid, both the mermaid symbol and the story most identified with her have deep meaning for queer and transgender individuals. As a symbol, the mermaid is non-binary in its essence. She defies binaries and dichotomies by living on sea and above it, being both human and animal, and having a human identity but no human genitalia, an identity not dependent on sex organs. This notion may be compelling for non-binary persons and transgender persons that due to gender dysphoria may feel a dislike of their own genitalia and a need to disconnect their gender identity from it. This idea is expressed by Jazz Jennings, a young transgender woman who received acclaim after creating and swimming with her own mermaid tail. A lot of transgender individuals are attracted to mermaids, and I think it's because they don't have any genitals, just a beautiful tail. I definitely secretly dream of being a mermaid. And even with the background of mermaids being linked with queer experience, the film also directly addresses the notion of playing with gender through the character of Ursula being queer-coded after the drag queen Divine. The song Poor Unfortunate Souls not only has a few queer references in it, but it mimics a drag performance. Ursula doesn't simply symbolize woman, she performs woman. Ursula uses a camp drag queen performance to teach Ariel to use makeup to never underestimate the importance of body language, to use the artifices and trappings of gendered behavior. Ariel learns gender, not as a natural category, but as a performed construct. When I listen to Reflection, I don't just hear Mulan's story. I hear my own story as a non-binary person who is still figuring out my place in the world. I hear the stories of those whose first taste of gender euphoria was dressing up as Mulan for Halloween, only to be hit with the realization that the clothes had to come off at the end of the night. I think I'll continue to be happy, as I see more and more LGBTQ characters be open and proud in movies and on TV. And honestly, I wish I had that type of representation when I was growing up. But at the same time, I'm grateful for the queer perspective I grew up with. It sucks to have to do the work to see yourself in media without representation, but when I look back, I instead think about how that's also been a queer tradition for as long as queer people have been ostracized by societies. And in a world that doesn't want you to exist, taking up your own space anyway can have its own power. When I've talked before on this channel about seeing queerness in media without explicit queer representation, I usually just say that it's what happens when you're positioned to empathize with something that doesn't empathize with you. But that's not Mulan. Because I do think that Mulan empathizes with me, even if it's in a way that others might not expect. Somehow I cannot hide who I am, though. I've tried
When will my reflection show who I am inside? When will my reflection show who I am inside?